set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil while we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, God, invade us now. We are your church, and we need your power in us. We seek your kingdom. We hug. our lives for your our joy and prize to see the captive's heart release the hurt the sick the poor at peace we lay down our lives for heaven's cause sing it out we are your church and we pray revive this earth Awesome. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Lifehouse Church. And uh, that's our prayer, that God would build his kingdom. And it all starts right in here, right? right. So we're looking forward to a great day today. And uh, thankful that you guys are here today as baby dedication uh, service. So uh, those of you who have little ones that you want dedicated to the Lord in just a little bit, um, while we shake hands right now, you can kind of come in place. But the rest of us, let's all t talk to each other. you got an hour and a half to talk. No, a minute and a half. One minute and a half. Um, introduce yourself to each other. Find someone you haven't met with and welcome them to church. We're so glad you guys are here today. Awesome. 
Well, if you are a first-time guest to Lifehouse Church, we want to welcome you guys. And maybe you're here because one of your family members, uh, we just prayed over them. Or maybe you're here um, just new. And uh, so we want to just uh, have ushers come forward right now. They've got a card for you, if you wouldn't mind, filling that card out and then dropping it in the offering basket, which is going to go by in a couple minutes from now. And uh, we just want to know who is here. And if you have any prayer requests or maybe a question about the church, that's what that card is there for. So make sure you fill that out and uh, and uh, get it in the basket today. Also, on your way out, we have a free gift for you and your family. So if you look to your left when you go out these auditorium doors, you'll see a big sign that says connect. That's for you guys. So go on over there, uh, grab one of those gifts for you and your family. And uh, I hope you feel welcome this morning. We're glad you're here. So if this is your very first time, would you mind raising up your hand real high? Get one of these cards from our ushers. Keep them up. Church, let's welcome these guys this morning. Thank you for coming today. Good morning. My name is Tim Holcroft, and I am a partner here. This is the time we worship through giving. Offering baskets will be distributed shortly, and for the millennials among us, additional ways to give are displayed on the screen behind me. Do we revere God? We may know God, we may love God, but do we revere God? Revelation 22, 13 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Jesus tells us in Luke and Matthew, the very hairs on our head are numbered. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son to everyone who believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Do you believe it? That the creator, the king of a universe that has an estimated 10,000 million, million, million stars loves each one of us so much that he knows the number of hairs on our head and sacrificed his son so we may have eternal life. Our God deserves to be revered continually revered amen is this my god is this your god a 2016 gallup poll of american adults asked how important would you say religion is your own life very important fairly important or not very important 53 percent said very important i was very blessed to have a grown to, to have grown up in a christian home with god-fearing parents where our faith was very important. I remember whining to my father about the commonality of my name, Tim. My dad turned to me and said, we were very intentional in naming you. It means honoring God and our expectations are high. Am I committed, laser focused in honoring God and everything I do as my name suggests? Sadly, the answer is no. And it's easy to blame family demands, busyness, society. Name your excuse. But as I contemplated for today, I believe it comes down to marginalizing God, being wishy-washy with my reverence. The sports world defines when a more talented team or athlete consistently loses as playing down to the competition instead of fulfilling their potential. We do the same thing with God. He created us uniquely for his purpose and glory and through his grace connects us to him through Jesus' blood and the Holy Spirit. But we play down to the sinful world and consequently attempt to bring God down to us, marginalizing him, making him what society says he is, becoming distracted with stuff when we should be rising up to him revering him, fixating on him, and utilizing our unique God-given purpose, purposeful talents and treasure for his glory. Romans 12, 1 and 2 are wonderful verses and frequently referenced in our church. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, 
pleasing and perfect will. There is no way, no way we are going to be living sacrifice for God if we do not continually revere him. No way we will maximize our time, our unique gifts, especially not the giving of our treasure. I love Natalie Grant's song, King of the World, and as I quickly read the verses with the chorus at the end, I encourage you to listen, to meditate on the words. I try to fit you in the walls inside my mind. I try to keep you safely in between the lines. I try to put you in the box that I've designed. I try to pull you down so we are eye to eye. Just a whisper of your voice can tame the seas. So who am I to try to take the lead? Still I run ahead and think I'm strong enough when you're the one who made me from the dust. Oh, you set it all in motion. Every single moment you brought it all to be and you're holding on to me. When did I forget that you've always been the king of the world? I try to take life back right out of your hands of the king of the world. How could I make you so small when you're the one who holds it all? When did I forget you've always been the king of the world? Is this you? Is this me? Do we revere God? Let's pray. God, you are the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who holds it all. I pray that we truly come to know, love, and revere you as only you deserve, that we rise to you, becoming living sacrifices for your glory, that we are abundantly generous and maximize our time, our unique God-given gifts and treasure and honor you.
Come with the Lord. 
and by his side the cross has the fire the world we thank you lord We thank you, Lord, that the cross has the final word, that we have victory in and through your son, Jesus Christ, whose blood was shed on the cross, making a way for us to know you, to have a relationship with you. Father, I pray that you will work this morning, continue to work this morning in ways that only you can. I pray this morning that as your word is about to be proclaimed through the preaching of your servant, Lord, that you would do what you promise and allow your word not to return void, that you would seek and find hurting hearts, Lord, and heal. That you would take hard hearts and hearts of stone and make them hearts of flesh. That you would open blind eyes, that you would unlock deaf ears. God, do, you who are mighty to save, you who are strong to redeem, do what only you can do this morning. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you be seated? In a moment, I'd like to introduce you, well, I'd like to introduce you at this moment to Jeff Sereka, who in a moment will preach. Uh, we as a congregation, if you're a guest or visiting here this morning, uh, just to let you know, we have been for many months now journeying through the book of Acts verse by verse. Jeff will lead us on the next leg of this journey, and I pray that you will be encouraged this morning as he shares about the testimony of the Apostle Paul and a changed life. Would you welcome Jeff Sereka? Good morning. I'm truly humbled and honored to to be here um, and just excited that God is is using me to stand up here today. And trust me, this is not in my power. This is is all his power. I'm just a regular guy up here for God's glory. And I I thank uh, Mark for giving me this opportunity this morning. Um, just a little bit about myself. As Mark mentioned, my name is Jeff Sereka. i Delaware through and through, lived here my whole life, uh, grew up, born and raised mainly on the, the Route 40 corridor up in, up in Bear in Newark. Um, and just to clear this up now, I do say water. So for all you water snobs out there, um, don't try to change us. And if you do say water, stick with that. Don't be afraid. Stay with it. Don't, don't be changed. Don't be changed in this way. We'll talk about other ways to be changed in a little bit. Um, I did play two years of college basketball at a community college level and decided that uh, the NBA money was, was just not there for me. So I, t- I took a, a more lucrative deal to be an accountant, and I'm a CPA today. So um, I've been married to my high school sweetheart for 16 and a half years, and we have, um, yes. <laughs> we have four wonderful boys. We have two biologically, 13 and 11. And then we are oh so close to making an official uh, adopting um, a seven and five year old uh, that will be happening in the next month. So we're very excited for that. Uh, they've been with us for over six months and they love coming to church. They love to pray. They love to boldly proclaim their love for Jesus. Um, and they had no knowledge of that before, so it's, it's, been, it's been awesome. And that was one of the scary moments that as we adopted, would these boys cling to our lifestyle of serving in the, in the local church and being involved in kingdom work, and we're so blessed um, that they, they have grasped onto that and, and, and want to do that. Um, adoption was changed for us. We knew our lives would change, uh, but now we have the opportunity to help them change, and that's what's, what's cool, that someday, we pray that someday they will also accept the salvation that our Lord has graciously given to us as a free gift. Uh, So it's it's cool. Um, But change is scary, right? Ultimately, the one thing we have as believers is change. There's a point in our lives that we can look back and say, that was the point where I turned my life over to Christ or I rededicated my life to Christ. And as believers, when we put our faith in Jesus, that's the moment that our hope changes, right? It goes from the things of this world to a more eternal hope. We see things from the other side now. It flips for us. It's an everlasting hope. It's the moment that our joy goes deeper as well. It's not surface. It's not materialistic anymore. Our joy used to be about what pleases us, what makes us happy. But now we should be shifting that focus outward to what pleases God and his kingdom. We should have a joy that goes beyond all understanding. And this joy should remain even when the circumstances doesn't call for it. 
That's the Holy Spirit working in us. It's not in our power anymore. John 16, 24 says, Until now you have not asked anything for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. We need no other joy when we have a complete joy in Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and pray before we get started into Acts this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this, for this time to come into your presence before your throne, Lord. And we just pray that as we, as we approach you, Lord, that you uh, will just uh, work in the lives of the people here in this building today, Lord. We just know you're here. The Spirit is here. We felt it already. And we just we continue to pray, Lord, uh, for you to work in lives of those that don't know you. And pray for softened hearts, Lord, even for those that need to turn back to you. We pray, Lord, that we will all have a sense of change after today, Lord. And we thank you once again for this time. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So today we continue our journey through Acts, as Mark mentioned. Uh, And it's been exciting to follow the birth and the early growth of the new church. And we've been following Paul on this journey. And we're going to continue to follow Paul through a pretty dramatic interaction he had with the Jewish people. And Paul is about to share his turning point, his turn-the-corner moment of celebrating the everlasting hope and joy that we all hope to have. Mark started us off last week in chapter 21, and we're going to finish chapter 21 today and, and into 22. But last week, he, he left us with pretty much a nail-biter. It was a, it was a to-be-continued moment as we saw that Paul had a triumphant ride into the city. And we saw the, the, the amazing parallel of Paul and Jesus as Jesus rode into the city. And then the humble reaction that Paul had. And then the harsh response of the people and wanting him away, away with him to be killed. Because he was falsely accused of bringing a Gentile into the temple. So we're going to continue that talk as Paul is bound in handcuffs and getting ready to be taken off. We're going to find out what happens next. So as, before we get into it, as we talk about change, I want you to see here, as a little side note, Paul's persistence and his passion as he talks about his love for his Lord. And how are we, in relation to that, how are we sharing our story? Are we using what has changed in us for the benefit of others who need to hear the good news as well of Jesus Christ? So let's go ahead and read Acts chapter 21, 37 through 40 as we wrap up this chapter. As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, May I say something to you? And he said, Do you know Greek? Are you not the Egyptian then who recently stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness? And Paul replied, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city. I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. And when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great hush, he addressed them in the Hebrew language. So here we see Paul's persistence right off the bat. Paul just went through this horrible moment. And if you remember last week, we learned that he was bloodied and he was bruised and he was battered for his Lord. And yet he steps up and says he wants to say something. And I can only imagine as being in that moment... And you have those people in our lives now where they, where they have something to say and you know they're going to say it and they're going to bring it. You can imagine how intense that was where he's about to be, he was, you know, just lowly, just, just to be taken away. But now he's, he's standing up and he is boldly has something that he wants to say. I think that's awesome, to, to, to that picture of just how far he would go for his, for his Lord. So my question is, how would we react as believers when we get resistance or when we get questioned or ridiculed about our faith, do we stand boldly or do we find a way to cower in the situation? See, Paul wants people to know where he's came from, where he comes from here. And he wants to share that time that he was changed. And if you don't know Paul's conversion story, we're going to look at the recap here today as spoken by Paul. But the initial conversion was recorded by Luke in Acts chapter 9, earlier in the book. And Paul brings up this special moment once again. And again, he's going to also share it in Acts 26. So he's not done with the story. And this is only the time that's recorded. You can imagine how many times that he has shared his story, how proud he was of his story. See, he knew that someone's going to care about his story. And he knew that he had a passion for wanting to see people changed. So we need to be proud of our stories because someone cares about our story. And how selfish would that be to keep our story to ourselves? We remember in John chapter 4, the story of Jesus' confrontation or approach of the, the woman of Samaria. 
And the woman at the well, she started her day pretty ordinarily with lots of baggage, lots of, lots of stuff happening in her life. But after her confrontation with Jesus, she was changed. She was changed. But you know what? She even took that further. She didn't say, okay, thanks, I'm going to get on with my day and back to all my problems. No, she dropped, what she, she dropped everything and ran into town. She couldn't keep it in. She left her jar at the well and she ran into the people to let them know of the Jesus that she just encountered. So why should we bottle it in after seeing such a great testimony of this woman? We've got to remember to always be ready to give an account too. Always be deliberate in our interactions with people because you never want to miss out on an opportunity. Because what if that's the only time that person is going to get a chance to be close to Jesus is through us. And how heartbreaking that would be to have an opportunity missed because of that. 1 Peter 3.15 says this. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. So always be ready, ready to make a defense, ready to say, what, let's be excited with what God's doing in our lives. That should, that should just be bursting out of us always. So now we're going to look at Acts 22 as we're going to look at verse 1 here. Uh, we're going to read 1 through 11. And then we'll talk about it. But this is, this is Paul's conversion story from him. First-hand account. Brothers, and this is Acts 22.1. Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. So right before that in 1 Peter 13, we said be ready to make a defense. So here's Paul ready to make his defense to the people. Verse 2 says, and when they heard that he was addressing them in, Hebrew, in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. So he has their, he has their attention. They're listening. They're listening very carefully. And he says this, I am a Jew born in Tarsus and Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as all of you are this day. I persecuted this way to the death. That's a capital W, so we're going to come back to that. So remember that in verse 4. Binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. And here's the story here. Verse 6 says, as, as I was on my way and drew near to Damascus, about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said, rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of the light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. So here we see here Paul, this is his shining moment, right? This is his one shining moment. And as a huge college basketball fan, you might come to mind the song One Shiny Moment, right, by the great Luther Vandross, right? A lot of great hits, but to me, this was his, this was his, his classic right here. If you ever watch college, March Madness, the championship game, game usually ends on a, a very late Monday night. But there's that cheesy song called One Shiny Moment that summarizes the tournament, puts a whole recap on the tournament. This year, I even made my oldest son watch it with me, and he was not thrilled to be, as I was, which made me not too happy. Um, But, you know, but you just look back at the blood, sweat, and tears that took place in the tournament. It was the culmination of getting to a champion. And now we see Paul was doing this. Paul was talking about where he was born and what his upbringing was. He had a religious background, but here he was persecuting Christians. And we talked about verse 4. I mentioned verse 4 earlier, and this is deep. He was persecuting the way, this way, Jesus, and delivering to prison men and women. And he was on his road to Damascus to incarcerate even more people and bring them to Jerusalem to be punished. So I'm going to s- stop here for a minute and I'm going to make a plea to those who haven't shared in this joy yet. Maybe you're afraid to make a change. Maybe you're afraid to see change. Or maybe you feel that the change is too far gone or that there's nothing you can do to make God love you. And let me tell you, as we read Paul's account of his conversion, do you think that he was too far gone? Do you think that he was too far to be adopted into God's family and that God couldn't use his story? See, he was doing wondrous things now for God, 
But don't you think as, he, as, he, as the words came out of his mouth that he was persecuting Christians, that there was still a tinge of guilt and shame when those words came out of his mouth, that he was persecuting those who he was now on their side and, and, and preaching the gospel and getting the word out there about the truth that Jesus loves them. This is the Paul that we are reading about now. And there's nothing that you have done that can keep you from the salvation that God wants for you, no questions asked. Paul felt it was so important that he shared it multiple times, as I mentioned already. So the first point I want to make here is we have to give a chance for change. In verse 6, we talk about the conversion, and it was for him alone. See, his companions that were with him didn't even understand what was going on. They saw the light, but they didn't understand what was happening. And Jesus encounters Paul and confronts him with the question, why are you persecuting me? How convicting is that, that Jesus is, is, is saying this to Saul? And how often do we go through our day and persecute our Savior because we choose a path that doesn't glorify him? Don't reject what the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives. And if you haven't made that change and you feel the tugging, it's God wanting to do something great in your life. So don't, don't push that aside. We talked earlier about the laying the foundation of a new hope and a new joy. This is what God wants for us. And you have those moments in church where you feel like you're the only one sitting in the auditorium. You feel like God's just talking to you, that it's, it's you and the, and the preacher. That, those are times where God's saying, yes, this is what I want you to get from this. This is for you. Romans 8, 20, 8, 26 and 27 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So the Spirit is, is ready to intercede for us. We can have that power in the Holy Spirit, but we got to be willing to put aside the burdens that are holding us back and, 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 the, and the lies of the enemy saying that, yeah, you'll never escape from this, and God will never love you like this. The Spirit is ready to intercede for us. And I think this is cool. You think about this. Acts is split up into two parts. We see two different journeys here. We see the journey of the apostles. Acts 1 through tw- chapters 1 through 12 talk about the apostles. And these are the ones who walked with Jesus. And then Paul's journey starts in chapter 13. But you see the, the, the apostles who we see Jesus literally handing the torch to them, right? Handing the torch through the Holy Spirit saying, something better is coming here, greater than me. I'm handing this off to you guys. And I, I was always a little obsessed with the, the apostles, done Bible studies on t- the 12 ordinary men. Um, just their, their personalities and their characteristics of how it all came together in the word. And they couldn't get out of their own way a lot of times. You know, they, they had issues amongst themselves of who was, who was greater. And, and I'm sure Jesus had a lot of rolling of the eyes moments with, with these guys. But now what's so cool is that you see what their focus is in Acts. Now that it's in their hands, right, with the help of the Holy Spirit, but Jesus is not physically on earth with them, now filled with the Holy Spirit. But they have a new passion. They have a new focus, and they have a, a goal that Jesus challenged them with before he left this earth. Go, make disciples. These were new people. They were, their lives were changed. So today we need to be still, and we need to listen to God and see how the Holy Spirit is going to work in our lives. So let's continue in Acts 22 as we read 12 through 16 next. Verse 12 says, And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and saw him. And he said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. And this is the next point here, is don't change alone. In verse 12, we see Paul make mention of Ananias. And Ananias was a very important part of Paul's conversion. So he's kind of looking back at all his moments, all the highlights of his conversion. And he decides to call out Ananias here and and the the role that he played in his life. Because... Paul couldn't do it alone, and we're, we can't do it alone. God doesn't call us to do this alone. And Heather and I worked in student ministry for seven years. Um, 
and the greatest fear and the most saddening thing was to see when teenagers would come to Christ or they would recommit to Christ and then, not, and then not surround themselves with those that could build them up and edify them and encourage them and be held accountable. It's so important. So I urge teenagers that are here today to surround yourself with godly influences. Follow Kent's example and the other leaders who are working with Kent. Look to those who are standing up for their faith and not afraid to be persistent about the change in their lives. Because if there's no fruit, you should be really questioning whether you are a Christ follower, there should be something. We should have a desire to want to serve and a desire to see other people come to the faith that has saved us. So you may also ask, what does Ananias look like? How can we be that positive influence for somebody? In Acts chapter 9, we learn a little bit more about Ananias when we hear the conversion story originally. But he was a follower of Jesus. He was obedient to God's calling on his life. And despite it being Paul... Ananias was fully committed to God's voice to reach out to him. He spoke into Paul's life. See, he could have have been like, no, that's not for me. That's the guy that kills Christians. Why would I be going to put my life in jeopardy to go to Paul? And he even even asked God. He wanted to make sure he was hearing it right, that, God, are you sure this is who? You, You know what he's done. You know what his past is. And, of course, God gave him that calling to go do that, so he did it. He was obedient to God's calling in his life. Ananias also challenged Paul. Not only was he in prayer for Paul, he urged him to get baptized, right? Verse 16 says, why wait? Let's do this. We're converted. You're saved. You're, you're, following, you're following Christ. Let's go get baptized. We can't do this in our own power. We need to speak into others' lives as well as being filled by others through discipleship. And if you're feeling alone, we need to reach out to, that, to those people who are, are succeeding in their faith. Do you feel that God can't even help in the small things? Because even in those small things, I was, I was having a, a football catch with, um, with one of my younger sons, the, one of the, the ones that we're adopting, and we're just having a catch, and he was catching half of what I was, I was throwing him, and, and he looked up to me and he said, I'm going to pray that God could help me catch more footballs. I said, you do that, and that's a good sermon note, so I'll keep that for Sunday. But even in the small things, just having a football catch, he realized that God can help with the small. It's not, it's not too, too stupid to go to God for something like that. So don't struggle through this life believing the lies of the devil that no one cares about us. So not only that our burdens can't be, can't be uh, washed by the blood of Jesus, but that there's also people that would care about our problems or care about the burdens that we have because that's just not true. There's a God that loves us enough to send his son to die for us. Acts 22, 17 through 21, as we continue. When I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him coming to me and and saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another, I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. And Jesus said to him at this point in verse 21, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And this is the last point here, is that we need to change and go. Once we're changed, we need not to sit there and be lazy and sit back and say, Okay, I'm good. I got my ticket into heaven. Nothing else is necessary. Because no, Paul didn't do that. Paul was commanded to go into the, to the Gentiles and, and start churches. And when we get to verse 21, as he said this, Paul's boldly not afraid to say the word Gentiles, right? Because now we see, if you read on in verses 22 through 29, um, that, there were, that the people got all riled up again. Paul was so close to getting out of there. He finally had the hush over the crowd, and they were listening and absorbing what he was saying. But now, because of he, was, he, he was bold, he was, he was just saying what was, what was um, uh, told of him by Jesus is to go out and make disciples, right? So he brought up the word Gentiles. It was, it was going to be more about what was inside those walls. He had to go out. He was commanded to go out and make disciples. It's kind of like you're so close to getting there, kind of like when your kids are almost all calm for the night, and then all of a sudden an older brother comes in and stirs them all back up, and it's like, oh, we got the house all riled up again. It was, we were so close to ending this night. So my question is, are we caring about our neighbors, coworkers, and family members? Do we care if they are not, if they are not experiencing the hope and the joy 
that we're talking about here. It should. It sh- you should care. Paul's story started at his conversion. And now as he shares his testimony, he faces one of the, 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 the greatest battles that he's faced in humanly possible. These people were ready to have him killed once again. We see the emotional roller coaster that's happening here. It started with the, with the ride into the city and everything was going great. And then all of a sudden it came crashing down and it's crashing down again. But you see, he's, it's not crashing down for him because he knows he's boldly speaking what he was commanded to do. Are we happy walking through these doors every Sunday and saying, okay, that's good enough, like a ticket punch kind of, kind of salvation? It shouldn't be like that. And it wouldn't be a sermon without bringing up Dave Ramsey. I, uh, I teach some classes, financial piece here, and I just love the financial side of that. So, But it, there's, a, there's a good lesson here is that when I have people in our class who are passionate about being debt-free or passionate about cleaning up their finances, they follow through with it because they're uncomfortable where they are financially. They're uncomfortable with what they're being enslaved with. So are we uncomfortable when we aren't living as Christ has commanded us? If we aren't showing the passion and we're not uncomfortable in that, then we're missing something. We need to examine that. And if we are changed, are we boldly sharing why we are changed? See, Paul was boldly sharing why he was changed. He knew that eternal lives were at stake. And Paul started where a lot of us have started. All of us start, right? We're all sinners. We're all in need of a Savior. Paul was right there as well. But you see, Paul took that further. He didn't bottle up his story. He didn't bottle up and punch his ticket and say, man, that was a cool, that was a cool interaction with Jesus. I'm good. I'm good until, until I die. No, he, remember, he remembered. He wanted to tell of his past. He wanted to tell even of the, of the hard parts of his past. He told of the, of the life he lived persecuting Christians. And he wanted to make sure that others knew that as well. His path could have paved the way for someone else who was persecuting. And I think that's important why we need to share our story. Because our story could be for somebody. You know, I, was, I grew up in a Christian school. I surrounded myself in a Christian bubble. And I was thinking that my story was always too boring to share. But you see, I lived a lukewarm life. I kind of sat on the fence and not really being bold in my faith, just kind of like it's there, but I was always protected in that bubble, always surrounded myself in the bubble. I wasn't confident in Christ. I wasn't stepping out in faith. And I had a lazy way about me in my faith, which is worse sometimes than being cold itself. So there's probably someone who can relate to that. And so my story needs to be shared. My story, somebody can relate to that as your story. Everyone has their own story. And there's people in this church, in this auditorium that want to share how Christ's love has changed them. They want to share how they've gone from doing it alone, doing it in their own power, to experience, experiencing the Spirit working. So I urge you to share how God is changing you. I can't say that enough. Eternal life is at stake if we don't share. If that person never hears about Jesus again, are we willing to pass up on that opportunity? And today we're going to have people that want to share the change in their lives. They will show something they struggle with, something they burdened them and held them back. But what's cool is that we see the power and saving grace that Jesus brought them to be a new person. And you might be sitting here, and as these people share boldly today, I pray that you'll be blessed, encouraged, and maybe even convicted that God can make these same changes in you, no matter what it is. And maybe you'll know exactly how someone is feeling because you're dealing with it too. Please accept change. Be ready to accept change. Help someone else change as well. Be ready for that. And I know for me personally, if I didn't want to make a change, I wouldn't be able to do this and be able to hold up my own sign if I wasn't willing to to show this as well. But I went from being a stuttering, non-confident, low self-esteem introvert to being an on-fire servant relying on his power and strength.
You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song.
to God be the glory, great things he has done. Jesus, you said, I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. You came so that we could thrive, so that we who are dead without you could be found and have life in you, so that we can thrive, so that we could not just have to muddle through life and exist, but so that we can thrive in you, in your name and for your glory. Jesus, you said that you have come to set people free, free indeed. So Lord, this morning, I pray that you would do just that. I know that in this auditorium this morning, there are people that are still bound. People who are blinded, living in darkness, Lord, shine your light into that darkness. Unlock chains this morning. Speak hope and joy and peace into people's hearts. Take hearts of stone and make them hearts of flesh. Deliver, redeem, restore, reconcile, provide, encourage, comfort, and bless in ways that only you can. You, Jesus, are the way, the truth, and the life. And in you alone can salvation be found. There is no other way. Father, I pray that you would speak to the one who needs to hear from you this morning. To the man, to the woman, to the child. That you would let them see your arm stretched out to them and give them faith to take hold of that arm, that hand that is stretched out to them. Lord, deliver. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can all be seated. You can be seated. Listen, greater is he that is in me. If you're a believer in you, than he that is in the world. Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And so, born again, child of God, I ask you, are you? Are you free in Jesus? Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So are you living an abundant life? Or are you merely existing, existing, muddling through? If that's the case, it need not be the case. These testimonies were shared humbly and listen, only because of the grace of God. I was a hypocrite. I was insecure and a liar. And by the grace of God, he saved me. And by the grace of God, he gives me opportunities to serve him. And he has called me to preach truth. In the Bible, it says, he who's forgiven much, loves much. Do you have a testimony? You can but it starts with placing your faith and trust in Jesus for salvation. That's just the beginning. So many people think that salvation is a destination. It's something that you have to achieve, and then it's over. No, it's just the beginning, the beginning of a relationship with God, the beginning of a journey with Jesus. Have you started that journey? If not, you can this morning. We're told in the word of God, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So this morning, I ask you, will you call upon his name? Will you call upon his name? He longs to hear you call upon his name. His arms are open wide to you this morning. His hand is stretched out as far as he can stretch it. Will you take his hand? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes and pray.